We're reading chapter four of our book, Shiloh. Here we go. Marty, Dad says when we're around the bend, sometimes you haven't got the sense to shut up. You can't go telling a man what to call his dog. But I'm mad too. Better than calling him Git or Scram. Judd Travers has the right to name his dog anything he likes or nothing at all. And you've got to get it through your head that it's his dog, not yours, and put your mind to other things. Well, the Jeep bounced along for a good long mile before I spoke again. I can't, Dad, I say finally, and this time his voice is gentle. Well, son, you got to try. I eat my peanut butter and soda cracker sandwiches with dad at noon, plus the zucchini bread Mrs. Ellison had left in her mailbox for him. And after all the Sears catalogs and mail is delivered, we head back to the Sistersville post office. I get my Coca-Cola at the gas station while dad finishes up and we start for home. I forget all about looking for cans and bottles. The can I'm holding is the only one I got. Judd Travers goes a-hunting near every weekend, don't he? I asked Dad. I suppose he does. Well, you can shoot at just about anything that moves. Well, of course not. You can only shoot at what's in season. Well, I'm thinking how about a year ago, I was fooling around up on the ridge and come across a dead dog, a dead beagle with a hole in his head. Never said anything because what was there to say? Somebody out hunting got a dog by mistake, I figured. It happens, but the more I think on it now, I wonder if it wasn't Judd Travers shooting a dog on purpose shooting one of his own dogs that didn't please him. Dad's still talking. We've got a new game warden in the county, and I hear he's plenty tough. Used to be a man could kill a deer on his own property any time if that deer was eating his garden. Warden would look the other way, but they tell me the new warden will find you good. Well, that's the way it ought to be, I guess. What if a man shoots a dog, I ask. <laughs> Dad looks over at me. Dogs aren't ever in season, Marty. Now you know that. But what if a man shoots one anyway? Well, that would be up to the sheriff to decide what to do, I guess. Well, the next day I start early and set out on the main road to Friendly with a plastic bag. Get me 11 aluminum cans, but that's all. Could walk my legs off for a year and not even have enough to buy half a dog. The questions I'd tried not to think about before come back to me now. Would Judd Travers want to tell sell Shiloh at all? And how much would he want him for, for him if he did? And even if I got Shiloh for my very own, how was I supposed to feed him? There aren't many leftover scraps of anything at our house. Every extra bite of pork chop or boiling pot boiled potato or spoonful of peas gets made into the soup. If Wood had enough money for me to have a dog and buy its food and pay the vet and everything, I would have had one by now. Daryl Lynn's been begging for a cat for over a year. It isn't that we're rock poor. Trouble is that Grandma Preston's got real feeble and she's been, uh, she's being cared for by Dad's sister over in Clarksburg. Have to have nurses anytime Aunt Hetty goes out and every spare cent we got goes to pay for grandma's care. Nothing left over to feed a dog. But I figure to get to that problem 
later on. I wonder if maybe in time, if I never see Shiloh again, I'll forget about him. But then I'm lying on the couch that night after everyone else has gone to bed and I hear this far off sound again like a dog crying. Not barking, not howling, not whining even, crying. And I get this awful ache in my chest. I wonder if it is a dog, if it's Shiloh. I know you want a dog, Marty Ma says to me on Thursday. She's sitting at the kitchen table with cardboard boxes all around her, folding a stack of letters and putting them in envelopes. Ma gets work to do here at home anytime she can. I wish we had the money so every one of you kids could have a pet. But with Grandma seeming to need more care, we just don't have, and, and that's that. I nod. Ma knows me better, and I know myself sometimes, but she don't have this straight. I don't want just any dog. I want Shiloh, because he needs me. He needs me bad. It's Friday morning when I hear the sound. Dad's off on his mail route. Dara Lynn and Becky's watching cartoons on TV. And Ma's out on the back porch washing clothes in that old washing machine that don't really work. Only the ringer part works if you turn it by hand. I'm sitting at the table eating a piece of bread spread with lard and jam. When I hear the noise, I know is Shiloh. Only the softest kind of noise and right close. I fold the bread up, jelly to the inside, stick it in my pocket and go out the front door. Shiloh's under the sycamore, head on his paws, just like the day he followed me home in the rain. Soon as I see him, I know two things. Number one, Judd Travers has taken his dogs out hunting, like he said, and Shiloh's run away from the pack. And two, I'm not going to take him back. Not now, not ever. I don't have time to think how I had promised Judd if I ever saw Shiloh loose again, I'd bring him back. Don't even think what I'm going to tell Dad. All I know right then is that I have to get Shiloh away from the house where none of the family will see him. I run barefoot down the front steps and over to where Shiloh's lying. His tail's just a thumping like crazy in the grass. Shiloh, I whisper and gather him up in my arms. His body is shaking all over, but he don't try to get away. Don't creep off from me the way he did that first day. I hold him as close and careful as I carry Becky when she's asleep. And I start off up the far hill into the woods, carrying my dog. I know that if I was to see Judd Travers that very minute with his rifle, I'd tell him he'd have to shoot me before I'd ever let him near Shiloh again. Well, there are burns and burrs and stickers on the path up the hill. And usually I wouldn't take it without sneakers. But if there's burrs and stickers in my feet, I hardly feel them. No Judd Travers and his hounds won't be over here because this hill belongs to my dad. Get me as far as the shad bush next to the pine, and then I sit down and hug Shiloh. First time I really have him to myself. First time I can hug him. Nobody looking, just squeeze his thin little body pat his head and stroke his ears. Shiloh, I tell him, as though he knows it's his name. Judd Travers isn't never going to kick you again. And the way his eyes look at me then, the way he reaches up and <sniffs> licks my face, it's like it seals the promise. I'd made a promise to Judd Travers I wasn't going to keep. Jesus, help me.
But I'm making one to Shiloh that I will. God strike me dead. I sit him down at last and go over to the creek for a drink of water. Shiloh follows along beside me. I cut my hands and drink, and Shiloh helps himself, lapping it up. Now what? Hmm, I ask myself. The problem is looking me square in the face. I got to keep Shiloh a secret. That much I know, but I'm not going to keep him chained. Only thing I can think of is to make him a pan. Don't like the idea of it, but I'll be with him as much as I can. I take him back to the shad bush and Shiloh lays down. Shiloh, I say, patting his head, stay. He thumps his tail. I start to walk away looking back. Shiloh gets up. Stay, I say again, louder and point to the ground. He lays back down, but I know he's like to follow anyways. So I pull him over to a pine tree, take the belt off my jeans, loop it through the raggedy old uh, collar shadows wearing and fasten the belt to the tree. Shiloh don't like it much, but he's quiet. I go down the path and every so often I turn around. Shiloh is looking at me like he won't never see me again, but he don't bark. Strangest thing I ever see in a dog to be that still. Ma's still on the back porch when the washer, with the washer, uh, it takes her near all day. Daryl uh, Lynn and Becky's stuck to the TV, so I go to the shed by the side of the house and I take the extra fencing Dad used when he ha had us more chickens. I take me a piece of wire too and go back up the hill. Shiloh's still there and he don't try to get up while I set to work. I string the fencing around the trunks of three small trees for corner posts and then back to the pine tree again where I fastened it with wire. Pen measures about six by eight feet. I go back down to the shed again. And this time I get the old rotten planks dad took out of the back steps when he put in the new. Pick me up an old pie tin too. I take the planks up to Shiloh's pen and make him a lean-to at one end to protect him from the rain. Uh, fill the pie tin with some water so he'll have something to drink. Last of all, I take the lard bread from my pocket and feed it to Shiloh in little pieces, letting him lick my fingers after every bite. I wrap my arms around him, pat him, run my hands over his ears, even kiss his nose. I tell him about a million times I love him as much as I love my ma. The worry part is whether or not he'll stay quiet. I'm hoping he will, because he was a silent dog to begin with. But all the way back down the hill to the house, I put my finger to my lips and turn back. Shh, I say. Shiloh, he don't make a sound like he had the bark beat out of him when he was a pup, and it just never came back. I'm tense as a cricket that night, tense when Dad drives up in his Jeep, afraid the dog will bark, tense when Dara Lynn and Becky are out in the front yard playing after dinner, squealing and yelling, after afraid that Shiloh will want to get in on the fun and maybe dig a hole under the fence. He never comes. I manage to take a piece of potato and some cornbread up to him before it gets dark. I sit down in his pen with him and he crawls all over me licking my face. If he'd been a cat, he would have purred. He was that glad to see me. Tell him I'm coming back tomorrow, some kind of leash for him. Tell him we're going to run all over that hill, him and me, every day. I tell him he's my dog now, and I'm not never going to let anybody hurt him again, ever. 
and then I leave, wiring that fence good. I go home and sleep a full night. First time in a long time. The end of chapter four.